Um, so this evening we are looking at the theme of love, which is rather nice. And we're doing that by looking at a painting by Rembrandt. We have done a session uh, on Rembrandt in the past. Um, we, we looked at Balthasar's Feast in the National Gallery. Um, but this evening we're going to be looking at a painting that's known as The Jewish Bride and it resides at the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam. So for those of you who've been to the Rijksmuseum uh, and seen all of their wonderful Rembrandts, you may have seen this picture. Um, I went to Amsterdam in 2018 and uh, was completely bowled over by it. I'd never seen it before um, and was, was really very mesmerized by, by the picture and particularly by this nucleus of hands that we find at the center of the painting um, that provides a kind of compositional focus. So as usual, I will share my screen. So we are really lucky that this painting has been posted on the Google Arts and Culture website, which does, as you know, uh, as regulars know, does mean there is sometimes a little bit of a delay with the Zoom. Uh, but it allows us a really brilliant image of the painting. Um, so we can, zoom, we can zoom right in and have a look at, at the wonderful impasto, the, the raised paint that Rembrandt is so well known for. Um, and we'll do, that, we'll do that shortly. But to start off with, I just thought we would, um, as usual, have a look at the painting in its full capacity. Um, it is a landscape painting um, in format. Um, it's about 120 centimetres high by 166 centimetres wide. So it's fairly large, about a metre and a half wide. Um, and it's painted in oil on canvas. And it's painted in the second half uh, of the 1670s uh, in the last four years of Rembrandt's life. So right at the end of his career. Um, the painting is signed, lower left. It depicts a man on the left who's sort of middle-aged. Um, we can see he's wearing a hat which recedes into the darkness um, and a uh, spectacular um, golden um, uh, sort of jerkin with a um, a cape over his shoulders, a slightly finer material cape that's draped over his shoulders. Uh, he has his left hand on the shoulder of the lady, who's a younger lady that stands by him. And his right hand is um, gently touching her chest. She uh, is dressed in red, very vivid red color. And again, when we get up close, we'll be able to see the different textures of her clothing. Um, and she's decked out in um, in pearls. So we're going to go a little bit closer so that we can see the fabulous jewellery um, that she's wearing. She's got a pearl necklace and she's wearing um, pearl bracelets as well. Um, and rings also. And we can see these are all catching the light, which kind of um, glitters across the surface of the canvas. And that's both done in terms of um, palette, both in terms of um, uh, the result is achieved by the colours he's using, these sort of light, whitey, goldy tones, but also in the technique and the texture of the paint. Neither of them are looking at each other, so they're both kind of shooting a gaze uh, past one another, um, and they are fused sort of purely through this physical connection, um, and although they're kind of in having this very introspective moment, it seems, independently of one another, um, it feels like there is, because of the physical connection, there is a, a spiritual uh, connection there as well. Just zooming out, so I hope uh, you aren't all feeling motion sick uh, just yet. You can see in the background, there is a sort of niche or an arch here. Um, and then there's a, a, a tree um, or a shrub of some sort on the far right. Um, and there are very um, almost sort of indecipherable um, shadows in the background, but the entire background is, is sort of bathed in darkness and very much is the background um, of the focus of the painting, which of course is 
uh, is the two figures. Um, I think the, the, the main thing to, to sort of mention, and I've already mentioned it, is um, the, the, the play of the hands here. You know, I've seen them uh, described as the most second, the second most famous hands in the history of art after Michelangelo's uh, touch in the creation um, between Adam and, and God. Um, and I'm not sure I agree with that because I don't think they're particularly famous but I certainly think that they are incredibly expressive of this emotion that we're going to be looking at today, which of, of course is love. Um, the way in which he's sort of tenderly touching her chest um, and she's gently um, resting her left hand on his. Um, there's a huge uh, sense of intimacy there um, just from this very, very subtle, um, subtle decision or subtle placement of hands. Um, and her other hand is sort of hanging modestly below. Um, and then his left hand, of course, is sort of bringing her in uh, towards, towards him. Um, but the, the play of hands, the three hands at the center creates this wonderful um, spiral. And actually you do tend to see this sometimes in paintings where three hands are used to almost sort of give a, a focus um, in, an, in some sort of area of the composition. Um, and I think if you can paint hands, then why not show off? Because they're um, notoriously the, the most difficult part of the anatomy to paint. Um, and we can see that Rembrandt certainly can do that here um, in this painting. Um, and I think the hands were certainly for me when I saw this painting, the flesh, the, the, the thing that drew me in, in the most. That said, um, if we get closer to the faces of the figures, I'm going to go very, very close here. Um, we can see the modeling of the faces as well. So this very, very intense focus on uh, light and shade in order to give a sense of three dimensionality um, and, uh, and, and um, plasticity, if you like. So the idea of these figures being sculptural um, in the round three dimensional rather than uh, flat on the canvas. And of course, he does that as well by layering um, the figures too. So the, the man's shoulder sits behind her shoulder and then gesturing towards the background as well. Um, so the painting is known as and has been known as the Jewish Bride which was a title that was given to, given to it in the 19th century and has sort of stuck with it. Um, it was loosely interpreted as uh, being a father and a daughter and a father giving uh, the, the, his daughter a necklace on, on, on her wedding day, um, as was tradition. Now, I, I think this was pure speculation. I don't think there was any reason or evidence to back this up. And the subject matter of the painting has, and still remains to a degree, um, contentious. Um, it's pretty convincing, I believe, uh, that, that these figures are the, um, have now been identified as the Old Testament uh, figures, Isaac and Rebecca, um, and that they are actually um, represented as real people. So in fact, this is a portrait, a double portrait, a portrait perhaps of a couple that um, are, are recently married um, and that they are being, they are being sort of personified or, um, or they're, they're being given the, given the identities of these Old Testament figures. Now, it might seem quite strange to us, but that was something that was in fashion in the 17th century. Um, both in terms of giving biblical identities to give a sense of, of virtue to the figures that are being represented, the portrait, uh, the people that are being represented in the portrait, um, or, or as mythological figures to give a sense of, um, you know, erudition or um, intellectual prowess, to have a sense of, of um, humanism and, and mythology uh, was very much something that that people would have have wanted to show off and be proud of. So we have a portrait or two portraits of contemporary figures um, in the guise of of Isaac and Rebecca. Um, and the story of Isaac and Rebecca is um, Isaac being the the Old Testament figure um, that we know of through Genesis, the book of Genesis. 
um, the, the son of Abraham, who, who is almost sacrificed by his father, um, perhaps a story that's more familiar. But Isaac and Rebecca were um, uh, uh, lovers. They were encouraged to um, move to um, the lands of Ibemelech, the king Ibemelech, a name that I can't uh, pronounce or remember, so I've written it on the edge of my screen. Um, and the king welcomed them to his lands, um, but uh, Rebecca was so beautiful that Isaac uh, told everyone that he, she was his, uh, his sister, um, his, sorry, his daughter, so as not to um, be, be threatened or be killed by anyone um, in order for them to, to get, get their hands on, on his, his wife. Um, now, this plan was successful until this king, Ib um, Abimelech, um, I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing that wrong, um, until he caught them in the act. He caught them, um, I think the words in the Bible are sporting, um, but in an intimate embrace. Uh, and so he discovered that, that um, Isaac had been lying and that this was in, not in fact his daughter, but his lover. Um, and he explained why he had done this to the king. And although the king uh, reprimanded him, he, he did um, sort of forgive him and he he commanded that that um, they were they were sort of left alone so that's the story of of the figure of the the characters of Isaac and Rebecca um, and it came to symbolize uh, sort of fidelity and they became a, a sort of very pure symbol biblical symbol of um, of marriage of course this beautiful virtuous wife and very protective um, husband now, the image I wanted to share with you um, is this one. Um, could you just put your thumbs up if you can see a uh, drawing now? Great. Um, so this is, uh, I'm afraid, a very bad reproduction of a drawing um, that is by Rembrandt and is in a private collection in New York. Um, and it shows uh, the figures of Isaac and Rebecca. Um, and this is the drawing that has allowed us to identify the painting. Um, it was two and two were put together. We can see the similar tree shrub on the right. Um, but notice, not most notably, we can see the figures on the left. And if you have a look here again, because this is in a private collection, I wasn't able to find a much better image, but you can see that the hands are placed in a similar um, way. His hand is resting on her shoulder um, and, and he's resting his other hand on her chest. Uh, her hand is hanging below and also um, touching his. Very, very sketchy drawing, very much just gestured towards. Um, and you can see that he's actually given Isaac two profiles. Rembrandt's very much playing and experimenting here. And we can see that Isaac's in profile. And in a better reproduction, we can actually see that Rebecca's leg is actually hitched up sort of over his leg. So this is certainly um, a more kind of explicit representation of the moment that they're in this intimate embrace. And up here, top right, we can see uh, the figure of Ab Abimelech, of the king, um, who is sort of, uh, who's uh, the voyeur, of course, in the scene. So it's identifiable um, as, as, as this moment in the Old Testament. Um, now, to move back to um, the painting, you can see that this has very much been adjusted. The figures are much larger in scale. Um, the hands remain the same. He, he's been given a sort of three-quarter length, uh, sort of a three-quarter um, uh, profile rather than uh, directly in profile. Um, and you can see that her leg is, is not hitched up. She's not sitting down in which she was doing in the drawing she's standing um x x-rays of this painting so technical evidence show us that actually rembrandt did um originally have her leg um over his but the 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 sort of likely conclusion is that whoever this painting was for represented as these two figures probably didn't want um, it then didn't want to be represented in this way and wanted more of a kind of decorous um, uh, representation. So he, he must have um, shifted, shifted that so that she was standing next to him instead. 
Um, I said I'd only show you one other image, but I did also want to show you this, which is um, an etching, um, which is after it's um, by, by an Italian artist, um, an artist called Sisto Badalocchio, um, and it's after a fresco by Raphael, the 16th century painter in the Vatican Loggie. Uh, and this represents the same scene. You can see up here, uh, this is uh, the king, uh, and this is Rebecca and Isaac in the same embrace with this leg over his. So um, although Rembrandt never visited Italy, this would this motif would have been disseminated in prints, uh, one of one of which is on on our screen now, um, and he would have had access to the composition in the Netherlands, uh, where he would have made first his drawing um, in this terrible reproduction, and finally his his painting. So. Um, what I'd like to do now is now that we've identified the figures is have a look because we have this image and because we're looking at Rembrandt this evening, uh, just to spend some time indulging in uh, the, the technique um, and the, the qualities, the, the sort of physical qualities uh, of this picture. So um, why don't we start with the sleeve of Isaac? You can see here that, um, the paint has been applied incredibly thickly in parts. Now, towards the end of his career, and as I mentioned, this is a late painting uh, by Rembrandt, he starts using, um, or he uses more frequently, shall we say, a palette knife um, to apply paint onto the canvas. Um, so here we can see that he's actually playing not only with, as we talked about different pigments, but also with the thickness and the texture of the paint. And he's doing that um, by, by applying it in thick swabs um, onto the canvas to give a sense of three-dimensionality and texture. Um, and here we get a, a, a almost a kind of mosaic-like effect of uh, whites and golds and browns um, to give the idea of a sort of waffled, shimmering, um, uh, uh, billowing or, or, or um, sort of puffy sleeve um, that's being worn by, by this figure of, of Isaac. Um, conversely, what he also does is he scrapes away the paint um, or he applies it very thinly to give an idea or a sense of um, very fine textured material. So um, he's creating a whole topography and world uh, in, inside his, his painting, or at least on the surface of his painting, to add to the atmosphere and, and the effect um, of, of the subject that he's trying to create, this sort of glowing couple uh, in the foreground. And that's even more stark here, uh, where we can see he's actually using, I think, the other end of the brush um, to scratch away uh, the paint from the surface of the canvas to give, again, to give a texture which um, up close I mean, feels very, very abstract. This uh, almost feels like a, um, a Helen Frankenthaler or you know, mid 20th century American painter um, really going for it on the canvas. Um, but, but this is Rembrandt trying to give uh, a sense of, of texture by, by um, experimenting with, with different um, techniques and application of paint, which was, was very, very modern. This, I mean, I reference 20th century artists, but you know, this is also um, uh, very much a, a feature of 19th century painters, um, post-impressionists, which um, we'll talk about shortly. Um, but if we zoom out again, you can see how, what effect he's trying to create. And that is to give this um, sort of translucence, uh, translucency to this uh, cape that's being worn and to, to give it a different texture uh, to this very thick and rich and voluminous uh, sleeve. And in the same way, he, he treats the, um, the reds in the dress of, um, of Rebecca. So we can see him scratching away the paint uh, in areas uh, here um, and also giving a sense of folds in the fabric but also um, layering it on um, in other areas as well. 
So I'm just moving around so that you can get a sense of um, the application. And of course, this is, um, you know, over 400 years, well, it's 400 years old. So um, we also have crack allure that you can see here from the, um, the, the light reflecting on the surface of the, the paint from the photography. Um, and, and of course, um, a bit of dirt as well, which is why it um, can feel quite yellow in, in the lighter areas. Um, but it's, uh, as I say, it's a whole world um, uh, when you get up close to a painting by Rembrandt, particularly a late painting, which is why it's such a joy to have such a fabulous image. Um, and if we move up, so he's created the same effect on her sleeve, this idea of a kind of waffle fabric. And look at how the light catches the top of the sleeve and he's left the rest in shadow. So he's applying a huge amount of white paint here to give um, this sort of luminous effect of the light catching uh, the surface of her sleeve. And then again, very, very thin application where he's trying to give a sense of, um, of gauze-like fabric. And then one of my favorite things about late Rembrandt paintings are these very, very um, sort of representative hands. Um, and we see that very much here, or at least body parts. You know, he really plays with flesh. Um, and, you know, here, these are very much just gestured in. Uh, but of course, from a distance, they give a real um, impression of a very carefully executed hand you know, notice this little tiny glimmer of light on the thumbnail, um, which is so, so effective in giving a whole um, uh, sort of voice, if you like, to, to, to that, that hand that's on the shoulder there, um, that, that is so convincing um, from a little more distance. Um, and it's very simple to say, of course, that he's picking up um, on all of the, the beads in her necklace, um, you know, he's using these white dabs of paint we know so well from uh, Vermeer's pearls, um, these, these very thick dabs of white paint to give a sense of the, um, uh, of, of the sheen of the, of the pearls. Um, the, the, uh, the impasto, the raised paint, giving a sense of the light reflecting from this very soft, smooth, soft surface. Um, again, look at that thumb, very, very um, uh, abstract and um, very gestural, um, but incredibly convincing from a distance. And he does that by using these, all this, this absolute myriad of, of, of colors. We've got grays and ochres and reds and um, sort of lighter pinks and yellows and whites um, to, to give a sense of, um, of, or give this sculptural quality to the, uh, to the anatomy. And then the bracelets as well, catching the light. And we've already looked at the faces, so he does the same to give this very um, uh, sculptural um, impression of of the face. So the way the light just catches the tip of her nose, um, obviously her rosy cheeks. You can see the light very, very carefully applied, just to just to give a sense of something hanging from her ears. We don't quite know what. Um, and then the same slightly wet lips um, of the man um, and, and the, the light catching his nose. And you can see in the, the either the ground coming through or, or the application of darker paint um, that his face is not only slightly more in shadow, but um, slightly older uh, as well. And his hat, of course, just receding into the darkness. Um, please do pop in the chat if there's anything you'd like to have a look at more closely. Um, I'm just going to zoom out a little while we talk about the painting in context. So this was, as I said, painted in the second half of the 1660s. Um, Rembrandt actually dies in 1669. So um, this has been dated 1665 to 16. 69 thereabouts so it really is in the the final years of his life and career um, and at this point he's 
he's really financially in completely dire, dire, complete dire straits. Um, Rembrandt died in, in complete poverty. He was uh, bankrupt at the end of his life, uh, which was partly to do with his personal situation, also to do with the large economic downturn in the Netherlands um, at the sort of in the mid century in, six, in the 1650s, um, probably um, I assume a result of the, um, the, the end of the war between the Southern um, Netherlands, the Catholic um, Republic, um, uh, the Catholic Southern Netherlands and the, the, the Dutch Republic in the North. Um, and I think I might be, I'm, I'm not sure I'd need to check, but I think that the sort of center of trade moved or shifted from Amsterdam um, to Antwerp at some point. So um, there was economic downturn in, uh, in Amsterdam, which was where, where uh, Rembrandt was living. Um, but his personal situation meant that he was uh, also completely bankrupt. So we'll get there. So he was born in 1606 in Leiden. So between The Hague and um, a small town between The Hague and, uh, and Amsterdam. Um, and Leiden was small. There was a huge um, artistic scene there. And he was initially sent, his father was a miller, um, and he was initially sent to a Latin school there. Uh, so they were clearly behind his education. Um, and then he actually matriculated in the, at the University of Leiden at the age of 14, which sounds very young to us, um, but was sort of um, sort of the normal age if you were going to university that you would have gone. Um, but he didn't stay there, University of Leiden being, um, I think, the oldest university in Europe or um, joint with Bologna. I'm not sure which is older, but um, still very much in existence today. Um, so he was there. He didn't finish. And he went to train with um, an artist called Jakob van Swanenberg in Leiden, a, um, a sort of little known artist. Um, he trained with him for a short while. And then in 1631, he goes to Amsterdam. Um, sorry, he goes to Amsterdam permanently in 1631, but in the mid 1620s, he goes to Amsterdam just for six months. And he trains with um, a, a painter called Peter Lastman, who was a, a, a successful history painter. And he carved out uh, um, a niche, Rembrandt, did when he got back to Leiden in the six, late 1620s um, of, of painting history paintings. Um, and he set up a studio with another artist called Jan Lievens in Leiden. Uh, and then he moved permanently to Amsterdam, which was where uh, the, the, the market was, where the merchants were based um, and where the money was uh, in 1631. And that's where he built a, um, a, a, a reputation as a, a very um, accomplished and, and very popular portrait painter. Um, and so that's why we have this uh, sort of um, uh, abundance of portraits by, um, by Rembrandt, um, because there was this drive for portraits and for history paintings, because of course, um, this was now a Protestant country since the Reformation. So there was very little appetite for uh, religious decoration or dec ch church decoration. So um, portraits were, um, and, and that's where still life starts um, coming into its own as a genre and genre painting as well. So artists had to look elsewhere um, to, to make money from painting um, beyond kind of New Testament um, compositions for, for churches. So Rembrandt's in Amsterdam. He meets a, um, a lady called uh, Saskia, um, Uhlenberg, and she was um, rather wealthy. She was the younger cousin of the landlord of the house that he was living in. Um, she was the daughter of a burgomaster, so she was quite well off. Um, and they had uh, four children together, only one of whom survived, um, sort of older than a year old, um, and that was Titus. And Titus um, lived, um, he was sort of, he's the, 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 the child of Rembrandt's that we know he lived almost as long as Rembrandt himself, but not quite. Um, and um, shortly after uh, he was born in 1641, um, uh, Saskia uh, died herself, um, I think as a um, sort of following childbirth, but not as a result perhaps from TB um, or something, something similar to that. So um, Rembrandt then was living with Titus on his own, so he needed to have some help. So he um, hired a, um, a, a, a sort of childminder, someone called um, Git, Git 
again, these Dutch names, I'm very sorry, uh, Git, Gitje yeah? Dix. Um, and she was, uh, she was a sort of help around the house, um, but also uh, became his mistress. Their relationship ended very badly. Um, and she actually took him to took him to court. She she um, tried to uh, try to to get get a lot of money from him. Um, the the problem was is that Saskia had left Rembrandt a lot of money in his will in her will, uh, but she said that he wasn't um, he wasn't allowed it if he would, if he were to marry again. So this um, this this lady Git Gitter, I think her name is. She was in the house. Um, and she was she was claiming that she had um, been been proposed to by Rembrandt, and so he wasn't um, he wasn't uh, able to have have the money that she had left him, and that they should have shared it. So it became um, it became uh, very messy. And all the while, in the same year, um, a lady called Hendrika Stoffels came into the house, and she became Rembrandt's mistress, and um, and and they they actually had a daughter together. Um, so um, Hendrika, you start to see in his later paintings that he paints portraits of her, um, and they lived a very humble existence in, um, I think it was in 1656, uh, Rembrandt basically declared bankruptcy, um, and there was a way of doing that, that you could turn in all of your possessions um, in, in uh, exchange, so, just so that you didn't, so that you didn't go to, to, to jail, um, and so he, he, he sort of, uh, jumped the gun, gave all of his uh, possessions to the creditors and moved to a very humble uh, neighbourhood where he lived with um, Hendrika and, and Titus, his son. Um, and uh, and, and, and his, um, Hendrika and, and Titus set up an art dealership uh, there and, um, and or an art business and they actually employed Rembrandt so that he wouldn't um, be sort of done by the creditors. So um, so, so he really was in, in dire circumstances when he was painting these late pictures. And of course, there are a huge number of self-portraits by Rembrandt um, across his entire career, uh, but we do see a proliferation in the latter years. And um, of course, that must have been uh, to do with um, ease, maybe old age, also, um, of course, not having to pay for models, um, but it is, um, rather a fall from grace when we think of how successful he was, particularly in the 1630s, um, and of course how how um, important he is in, in the history of Western art uh, today. Um, so um, he he and um, Hendrika and Titus all um, sort of died within a few years of one another. Hendrika first, then Titus got married and died only seven months after he got married. And then Rembrandt dies in 1669. And the three of them are buried together in the Westerkirk in Amsterdam. Um, so um, that, that's sort of where the picture fits in. It fits in at the, end of, at the end of his life, whether or not the sort of quite melancholic tone of this picture, the, the somber palette is something that one wants to read into um, beyond his representation of, of this couple. Um, a, a sort of um, implementation, perhaps, of his personal circumstances. I'm not sure about, um, but but that that sort of um, muted palette we very much see across his later works, with this uh, very vibrant and luminous um, uh, light, um, which he's he certainly sort of starts picking up from Caravaggio in the 1630s, uh, but then makes his own um, in in these latter years, um, and he does that, of course, through texture. Um, very much as we've seen, and that's really very unique. Um, the final thing I wanted to say was that, um, as I mentioned earlier, this does feel quite reminiscent, this painting of, uh, of a 19th century painter, um, uh, post-impressionist painter that we know very well, um, and that is uh, Vincent van Gogh, another Dutch painter, um, of course, painting a couple of hundred years later. But if we look at something like this sleeve, um, we very much get a sense of that sort of modulated um, brush stroke that we know so well from Van Gogh's work. Um, and there is a wonderful anecdote. And just as we started, I was trying to find it in my book on the letters of Vincent Van Gogh, but I couldn't, I'm afraid. So I'm not able to read it to you um, uh, uh, by um, uh, in prose. I, I can only just um, uh, paraphrase it. 
But um, when this painting went on display at the Rijksmuseum in 1885, um, it had been in a private, sort of private collection in, in Amsterdam, at least, um, yes, it was in Amsterdam, um, a major collector. Um, uh, and um, he had bequeathed his entire collection to the Amsterdam, uh, to the uh, Rijksmuseum, about 250 paintings, um, including this one. Um, he had had a, um, a, a sort of house museum that you could make an appointment to go and view his collection. And then that turned into a private museum after his death. And then um, that subsequently merged with the Rijksmuseum. So um, he was a, um, a major um, benefactor to, to the Rijksmuseum as we know it today. Um, his name was Adrian van der Hoop. Um, so he gave this picture to the Rijksmuseum. And in 1885, the pictures went on display. And Van Gogh was um, uh, said to have, well, he writes in a letter um, that he stood in front of this painting and wept. Um, and that he, uh, he says that he would rather take 10 years off his life. He would prefer to take 10 years off his life or he would exchange 10 years of his life um, to spend two weeks in front of this painting. And he would be satisfied with um, a stale crust of bread. Um, so this was a painting that Van Gogh was hugely admiring of, um, and I think that we can we can see that, um, of course, not only in its uh, incredibly uh, tender um, expression of love, uh, but also in its um, in its in, in its execution as well. Um, thank you very much, and have a wonderful evening. And it's still light. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.